friends, uh, this is 2022. And America is living and fighting through a pandemic. People are still dying. People are still saying some crazy things related to this pandemic. And no surprise, at least not to those of us in this room who know all too well, not too personally, who gets hit the hardest by this pandemic. Right? So I hope you're listening to me because I have to tell you about another pandemic. Put that one aside for just a second. The next pandemic I've got to tell you about, I have to tell you about because I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services. And that's this pandemic that we call COVID-19. COVID-19 is also killing us. COVID-19 is also giving us people who say some crazy things. And COVID-19 is hitting us harder than most. But it's the first pandemic I think I want to talk to you about. Get my back. And that's the pandemic of racism. And if you were listening to me, you probably thought I was going to talk to you about something else, about COVID. You and I know a lot about COVID. We have family members who can tell us some sad stories about COVID. But I, I think it's important as the president's chief officer to deal with health that we talk about that pandemic that's lasted a lot longer than COVID in our lives. Because racism affects our health every day. And so I want to thank you for letting me be here and talk to you about that pandemic. That pandemic, like the COVID pandemic, we've seen in many stages, right? Many variants. Remember, it was states' rights, then it became Jim Crow, then it was separate but equal. Now, I think you can see it in parts of the country is coming out again. Now it looks like, well, don't teach the past, right? Some people are telling you that they're going to, it's okay to mislabel the truth. They talk to you about socializing alternative facts. And these waves kill. They may not kill immediately. You may not see it in front of you. But when someone tells you that we should not teach the full truth of the past, they're asking you to forget what killed so many of us and will do it in the future. And so it is important to talk about what we're doing at the Department of Health and Human Services, Reverend Sharpton today here speaking to the National Action Network because Administrator Brooks LeSure and I have an obligation to do with all pandemics, not just the one we call COVID-19. And so I am honored and privileged to have a chance to speak to you about what we're doing at the Department of Health and Human Services to address the pandemic. The root pandemic. When I came to the position of secretary about a year ago, 63% of white adults in America had received a dose of the vaccine. Achievable through a set of strategic priorities that we aim to carry out each and every day of this administration. We're positioning agriculture and forestry sectors and rural and tribal communities to be climate leaders through investments in research and development in climate smart solutions. We're, we're creating more and better markets for producers and consumers by addressing vulnerabilities in our food system and building a food system that is fair, competitive, distributed, and resilient. We're tackling food and nutrition by ensuring Americans have consistent, safe, healthy, and affordable food, essential to optimal life and well-being. We are striving to ensure an exceptional work environment across the department and for our workforce. I am personally dedicated to our youth in agriculture and farming to prepare the next generation for protecting and for growing our food system. 
to lifting up the voices of and empowering our women agricultural leaders across the globe and to address farmer stress and rural health disparities, especially as the food supply chain continues to be impacted by COVID-19 and the conflicts abroad. Central to the work of advancing racial justice, equity, and opportunity, and to reducing barriers to accessing USDA programs and services, we have a goal of rooting out generations of systemic racism and discrimination. And at USDA, we are already prioritizing equity. We know that the farmers' frustrations run deep and are rooted in their own daily battles as they struggle to make ends meet, to maintain their land, to put food on their tables, and to see that, that their children have a shot at economic prosperity. Systemic bias can flourish in practices that generally appear neutral on the surface, but all too often and for far too long, USDA programs have been designed to benefit those with land, with the experience of equal protection under the law. I'm going to do my part. You know, when I accepted the role as the 18th Secretary of HUD, I knew that there was a great task before me. We faced a number of crises. We still redlined. Right. We still don't own the black people and brown people and poor people. We still undervalue people's houses just because of the color of their skin. But I remember, Reverend, when Jesus said to his disciples, to whom much is given, much is required. And I have been given much. I've always had a home. Now, mind you, it had a whole lot of people in it. <laughs> we had a duplex, Reverend, and on one side was my great-grandparents, my aunt and uncle, their six kids, and whoever came in the South on our side, it was my grandmother and my mother, and all of us, my brother, my cousins, and whoever came from the South. But that's all I knew. And it was all right because I always had a safe place to call home. And everything I loved was in that little house. And everybody should have the same feeling to feel safe at home. So I believe that I am required, that I am obligated, that I am charged to help those who have been overlooked for far too long. It is part of the responsibility that I have to ensure that every person that wishes to buy a home in this country, especially people of color, have that opportunity. Right. And for those who live in public housing, those who are in my care can live safely and be treated with dignity every single day. It has been more than 50 years, Reverend, since the Fair Housing Act was passed, and we were just talking about it. But the gap between black and white home ownership is bigger today than it was in 1968. It, it absolutely is a shame. But under this administration, the Biden-Harris administration, we are tackling the root causes of discrimination in home ownership because we know, for us, owning a home is our greatest source of generational wealth. So last summer, the president appointed me to be the chair of a task force that examines racial bias in home appraisals. You've seen the stories of how our, our homes are are devalued and undervalued just because we live in black communities. If we could just close that gap and not lose billions and billions of dollars every year because our properties are undervalued, we can make a big difference in this country. And I know for a fact, because I'm one of those people, I live in an all black community. My house is two doors from an all white community. My house is bigger. I got a bigger lot than the house to do with something. My house is valued at $25,000 less. Mm. So just think that every four years I lose $100,000 mm. in equity and wealth. Just think what happens when you multiply that all across this nation. It is billions and billions of dollars. But let me tell you what, it's going to stop right now. Because they use it. I'm using it. I'm not afraid.
way to do what is right. And to the president's credit, he is excited about the work we are doing. We're going to make sure that that changes. We're also going to make sure that people have a real shot at buying a home. So we know that most people of color, when they come to buy a home, one of the biggest impediments is student loans. You know, our parents don't always have the kind of money to send us to school when we have no debt. So what we've done, because we knew it was a problem, we've now neutralized student debt. If you get an FHA insured loan, we're going to make sure you get it. That's what happens when we put the right people in the right places. I got a team of people. Y'all stand up so they can see y'all. Just stand up and wave at people. These people know what they are doing. We also, remember, are coming up with a new product where we can assist people by, instead of having a 30 year mortgage when they get in trouble, we're going to refinance those mortgages and make that, that mortgage now 40 years. So that we can reduce your payments, reduce your interest rate. Yes, it will take you longer, but you still have your house. We are asking in this budget, the president's budget for 23 is asking for down payment assistance. Yeah. We know most people of color can't pay their rents. It's the down payment. Down payment. So we are now trying to do down payment assistance so that we can get people in homes and they do put the down payment on the back end. Yeah. Um, We have told banks that it's okay to do special things for people who have historically been underserved. And see, they kept saying it was discriminatory. No, it's not discriminatory. And so we are saying to you, you can do that. We're going to make sure we have oversight of fair lending. When people come to us and say that they've been discriminated against, we, not, we have a hotline on our website. If you think you've been discriminated against, then you need to call us because we're going to look into it. When we vote, and let's, let's put it out there. I'm going to put it out there. I know that black women have been and made the difference if Trump was reelected or not. Black women did that. That's right. And it makes me furious, furious, absolutely furious, that we have to go through this cycle every 15 or 20 years to keep our right to vote. Why is that? Because they knew one day they would try to turn back the clock. So every 10 or 15 years, the Congress gets together and decides whether black people should vote. That should have been a right. Once it was given, it was permanent. As first class citizens in this country. Every 15 years or so, we're going to decide whether, well, let's say, can they, should they? All right, we'll do it again. No, no. The next time we do this, we have to try to make sure that it's permanent. That's why I helped pass the Freedom to Vote, the John Carl Lewis Act. It would make Election Day a national holiday. And just think of how many people that would help that have trouble voting because they have to get to work or if the line is long in the morning they have to go on to work or then when they get off they're a little tired and don't go. If it was a national holiday, you can get up and go anytime you want. But that would make too much sense. That would help too many people vote. It would make voting more accessible for all Americans. And it ends the partisan cutting up the congressional districts. In Florida, there, or that governor down there is about to wipe out three of my colleagues, and only one of them is going to be in a district to run a race. But they are wiping out the three black districts in Florida and cutting them up to make sure an African American can't win. We've got to stop that. We gotta stop that. Even my district has become more white. I had the most African American majority district in the state of New Jersey, and 
somehow I ended up with them taking people away from me, but it didn't impact me to, to, the, to the point of my Florida colleagues. But we have to be careful and mindful of this going on all around the country, Ohio and everywhere. And it dilutes, it dilutes our power. It dilutes our power. Even more important, states with a history of voter discrimination under the John Lewis Act would need federal approval before they could change their voting laws. And we've got we to gotta get that put back in the law. There's never been more important time to pass this bill than right now. I'm fighting to secure the right to vote for all Americans, and especially African Americans. And I'm not apologetic, yes, for African Americans. Now, sometimes they want to, you know, slow you down. Oh, you just, you're just just picking on African Americans. What about all Americans? No, you pick them out every day. So I'm here to defend them every day. But it's not just our votes that we need to protect in this country. It's our lives. That's why I was proud to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to eliminate police brutality. One of the most important votes I've taken since being in the Congress. Advanced chokeholds, George Floyd, and no not warrants, Breonna Taylor. And it creates more accountability when police officers use legal force. Derek Chauvin. It sets up an independent review of incidents when police use force, and it creates a database of those incidents. That I look like without professional hair and makeup. And I hope you're not too disappointed. We were doing our own. We were doing our own during the pandemic. It was rough. Um, it's wonderful to be here with all these wonderful people. Uh, this esteemed panel. Thank you, Loretta. Thank you, Nan. Thank you to you for being here. Thank you to, to the legendary Rachel uh, for inviting me. I was uh, possibly going to be in uh, Ukraine this week, uh, which is why I, I, I told Rachel first, but I'm, I'm here instead. And I think um, I, I would give a little sketch of where things stand, I think, in the media. And, and it, it jumps off of something the Rev said. Throughout his career in public life, <laughs> as the ref said. He has gotten acclaim and criticism for his singular ability to draw attention. I think we could agree, right? Okay. Attention, it is, I have come to believe, is the single most resor important resource of the 21st century. That attention is prior to everything else, persuasion, mobilization, change. Attention is the first thing. And I want to give an example of, of that that we're seeing right now in Ukraine. What does Russia have? Russia has an enormous army, much bigger than the Ukrainian army. Russia has some of the largest fossil fuel exports in the entire world. Natural gas they sell to Europe, oil they sell around the world. Russia is a much larger country than Ukraine. It has many more individuals, men, under arms than Ukraine. What does Ukraine have right now? They have will. They have will and determination. They have the world's attention. They have the world's attention. Now, they didn't have the world's attention for the last eight years when a shooting war was happening in that same country by those same forces that has killed 10,000 people in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, in, the, in what's called the Donbass. I mean, we didn't cover it that much. Everyone in this room woke up every day, that was just a thing that was happening in the world, like a lot of things that are happening in the world. But the invasion changed things. And suddenly, we had an interesting situation. Russia, a traditional authoritarian Petro state, run by an ex-KGB intelligence officer. Okay? So you're betting on who's going to win this, right? An ex-intelligence KGB officer 
many more individuals under arms. Versus a country that is run by a comedian. A comedian with a camera. So what does a comedian learn how to do over the course of their life? Get attention. Funny thing, you may or may not know this. The, the, the show that, the big hit show that Vladimir Zelensky was in. It's a very funny show. You can actually watch it on Netflix, and I have watched it, and you know what? It's funny. It's actually, it's a good show. Subtitles. Vladimir Zelensky had a show called Servant of the People. Servant of the People is a story about a somewhat hapless high school student who still lives with his parents and goes on a rant against corruption in Ukraine that is caught on video camera that is then posted to YouTube and goes so viral, he is propelled into the presidency. Whoa. That's the comedy he started that then led him to being propelled to the presidency. And so as fate would have it, the person running Ukraine at the moment it faced an existential threat to its well-being from the weapons and the army of Russia was a man who had spent his life developing one thing, which was the ability to capture attention. So what do I mean by attention as a resource? It's almost like a currency. It could be spent. It could be traded. Zelensky realized from the first moment that having the world's attention would be the necessary precondition to Ukraine's resistance to Russian aggression because, of course, they were outmanned and outgunned. Those videos of him walking through the streets of Kiev, those cell phone videos where he refuses to leave. And she told the world, and the press was like, what are you saying? We're not supposed to care. And she made them care. Fast forward to George Floyd, when both you and I were on the air together talking about this, we've come a long way because, I'm going to speak for myself, I felt comfortable expressing my rage. I was tired of being this impartial, and he say, who says, no, I'm mad as hell because I have a son that looks just like George Floyd, who could also be targeted. without all of the journalists who opened the doors for us. So as an African-American journalist, we've come a long way when a sister could sit on television and say enough is enough. I've had enough of this. Aaron Morris at the Associated Press, uh, which is a, a global organization. Uh, Associated Press, for those who don't know, was started by other news organizations, and they capture a whole lot of news that finds its way into all kinds of different platforms and newspapers all around uh, the country and indeed around the world. Uh, what, what's your perspective on the coverage of both of these cases and what became sort of a worldwide explosion of protest in reaction to them? I think one of the things that, uh, you know, the mistake that the media often makes in covering these things is, uh, is to make it seem as though uh, those of us who rise up, that we don't actually care about our communities because there's something on fire or, or something's being looted. But, but the reality is, how else are you going to hear uh, that, that we're angry? And, and how can the media do a better job or a good job, really, of, of properly contextualizing those images. If you see it over and over and over again, you can, you know, you can watch CNN, MSNBC, or any of the other uh, you know, news channels and think the whole city was on fire. So, but it's not. Uh, there, you know, we, we really have to be careful what, as, a, as journalists, what we put out there and how we contextualize it. Uh, and I think that was something that was done well by some uh, in 2020 during the protests and, and not done so well by, by others. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I would love to, to actually uh, mention, especially what Chris Hayes said about this being a violent country. You know, we, we talk about violence in a very limited way. And, and, and I think we have to expand what we think or mean about violence. You know, there can be economic violence. You know, the student loan debt crisis is economic violence, especially to the black community. Um, there's er, er, uh, environmental violence. 
violence that takes place in our communities. The Flint water uh, crisis is one example of that. There's policy violence when something you sh that should be passed isn't passed. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a disinvestment in our communities. When our roads are not fixed, when our schools are, are falling apart, uh, when our water systems are not up to snuff, that is also violent. So uh, I think when we when we talk about the movement, we talk about this racial reckoning okay, that we so saw, you know, in 2020. Let's expand what we mean by violence as journalists. Let's cover all of those those aspects of violence. Not working here. The key again is the the, the the reckoning, the, uh, the the enormous amount of attention that was suddenly paid. Uh, to uh, the, 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 the cases like George Floyd really burst, just as Aaron was suggesting, into a lot of other different fields, including legislation, right? I mean, there's a lot of policy, a lot of, uh, a lot of electoral outcomes, a lot of, uh, of uh, follow-up. What kind of a job did we do, do you think, collectively, in, in, in really sort of making sure that didn't get lost in the process? The thing that, um, when I think about what happened to George Floyd, I watched just there we go, can you hear me? There we go. Um, when I continuously had to cover, I was a video reporter at the time, so I continuously had to watch and cut video of what happened to George Floyd and his murder. Um, and I had what I know now was my first and thankfully last panther attack. I swept through my clothes, I was crying, my, fiance, my now fiance couldn't like, figure out how to calm me down. He called my mother, um, which you know. When your black son, the mom was the only one that could <laughs> calm down, and so she was she was able to calm me down. Um, and I did a tweet thread that was because I kept having people in DC asking me, you know, I don't understand this. How can things like this happen? And, and does this happen to you? You're in Washington DC. You're political. Reporter. This could never happen to you. And you, uh, my hope was to explain to people as a black man, not as a reporter, as anything like that. Um, how this is here for all of us. How I myself walking in the Washington DC have been stopped by cops in my neighborhood asking me, what am I doing here? Well, what are you doing here? I live here. <laughs> um, and so when we looked at trying to cover those things, and especially the legislation that came out, I think that in DC and DC politics, sometimes we focus too much on the sauce of making, right? Um, and we cover a lot of things as a horse race. And we forget often that the, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was about the first part of it, the George Floyd part, right? How important it was that this kind of, these kinds of things don't happen anymore in this country. Um, I think the evolution of how we've covered things has happened, right? Politico did not have um, kind of an infrastructure at the time to really cover something like this. Our job was to cover power. Politico was founded to cover power and who has it. And so we looked at it, and I think a lot of organizations did, is, you know, not discover the powerful, but who wants power? What does that mean for policy and politics in this country? What does that look like? I think that evolution has happened, and that has also led to the evolution of people covering legislation a little bit more. I'm lucky, Jonathan and I are lucky to work at a place that also has a whole host of people, hundreds of reporters who just cover policy, who cover the ins and outs. of little coverage, and that was a lens through which we saw and reported on uh, this reckoning, this racial justice reckoning, like in the in the hip hop community. Uh, well, first, I uh, thank everybody for being here. Thank the National Black Network, uh, Sharpton, uh, Reverend Jackson. I see you here. I see the daughter of Malcolm X here. I just had to say, I'm sorry for going out of school. Uh, I'm a I see you, see you here. Um, culturally, culturally, we as a people, uh, we dictate culture in America, black people, uh, Afro-Latino people, uh, people of color and heritage. We, we create culture. So culturally, in the hip-hop world, it was outrage. Um, and if anyone knows anything about hip-hop, hip-hop uh, will be 50 years old in 2023 next year. A lot of people don't know that. Started down there, my brother, uh, boogie down Bronx, Ruben Diaz. Um, and culturally, hip hop has always uh, been about storytelling uh, beyond the beat. Unfortunately, it kind of lost its way, but culturally, you had so many influencers from not just hip hop culture, but black culture, um, keeping this issue 
live in the front. But what I wanted to say is that as an owner of media properties, that is absolutely key. Not just it's covering it, not just covering the story, but covering our people. Not just telling the story, right? But also actually dictating and programming a campaign that's gonna empower our people. And the number one journalist in this whole movement was Donella Frazier, that young girl with that camera. She was the number one journalist that culturally said, I'm not gonna allow this to happen. And she was the owner of her camera. She was the owner of that content. And it wasn't traditional media, print, television, or radio, it was social media that she uploaded it and programmed it because she had the access and distribution to her page. So I understand culturally it was, it was a major issue because that sister caught something that we knew happened every single day, but traditional media wouldn't show it or they didn't have their cover cameras in position. She was in position. And the whole thing about the attention issue, and I'm glad Chris Hayes spoke to it because I was about to light him up, but he caught himself <laughs> because he talked about attention as being powerful, which it is, Rev is way more than just an attention seeker. Our movement doesn't last on just attention, even though it's important, very important. But attention with our retention is a waste. And we can't have retention without institutional ownership and power. So that's what we have to do. That's why they say no justice, no peace, because they want to have a continual retention of activism so that we make it newsworthy for the journalists to pay attention on it every single day. And so let's keep putting attention, but build our institutions and ownership. We need you to support black-owned businesses. Because sister said, she said, I felt comfortable expressing my rage. Now she can say that, why? Because she's a superlative journalist, she paid her dues, she's barely an icon in our community, and she's at a station that cares about these issues. But what about if we had more black-owned media where all of them can feel comfortable? Because if they get fired, they can go down the street and get their job. So I'm here to talk about not just media and coverage, but I'm here to talk about building our own media and owning our institutions. Because unless we do that, we're always going to be subjected to the editor and the publisher and the owner cutting out our stories. General America believed that there are no crises really happening out here, and this is an isolated incident, and the one or two police officers will be disciplined or fired, everything will be fine. So we had to count on the black journalists you see on this panel. We had to count on Reverend Sharpton, who came on our stations to do a town hall. We had to stop the music because we realized it was up to us. We saw in March 2020, I remember one of my mentors, I remember Lloyd Williams called me, I'm on the board of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, and I'm looking to him for some uplift, and this is in late April, and he starts to cry on the phone because we had lost another one of our board members. So we knew, with the way our communities were left behind out with COVID, that it was not gonna be anything different for George Floyd, so we had to take it to the streets. And thankfully it was our journalists, our videographers, our photographers that got out here, told the stories, got the information to us, even through social media. And for that, I think 2020 was one of the most pivotal years for journalism, especially black journalism in American history. We will write a book on this one day, students will study it. But journalism in our schools, more important than ever. Everyone believes because of social media you don't need people to study journalism anymore. That could not be further from the truth. Invested, investigative journalism saved so many lives and continues through the pandemic, through George Floyd, through the election of 2020. Uh, journalism matters, black journalism matters as much as it ever did.
further without acknowledging my brother, the scholar, Dr. Michael Eric Tyson. Also on the stage. So as we think about, and the reason why I asked for a wireless mic because I don't like podiums that much. I like to be as connected to the audience as possible. I don't like these barriers in front of in front of me when I'm saying a couple of words. But as we think about an intellectual foundation for racial and social justice in the revolution, and I believe black and brown people need in this country, we gotta begin that conversation with Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. <laughs> And his intellectual foundation. Hey, y'all better not be laughing at me, man. We talking some serious talk over here. I also want to give a couple shout outs to my sister, Mayor Sean Patterson Howard, who is here, representing the great city of Mount Vernon. I also absolutely have to give, have to give a shout out to my brother, former and always borough president, Ruben Diaz Jr. of the Bronx in the building. Absolutely. So, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Congressman Jamal Bowman, formerly Principal Jamal Bowman of Cornerstone Academy for Social Action Middle School. Now, before running for Congress, I worked in education for 20 years. I started my career in the South Bronx as an elementary school teacher. I then went on to serve as a high school guidance counselor and dean of students at the MLK campus about a mile uptown from here. I then went on to become the founding principal of my own middle school in the Northeast Bronx. I wrote a proposal. I thought the education system wasn't doing enough for our children. I thought the education system wasn't doing enough to unlock the unlimited potential of our kids. So I wrote a proposal and submitted it to New York City. And I made the argument that the city should give me the opportunity to open up my own public middle school. I made the argument in 2009. January and by September, we opened up the Cornerstone Academy for Social Action Middle School in the Bronx. Now, I had the privilege and the blessing and a very humbling experience in running that school for 10 years. And when you look at the data, our black and Latino students outperformed black and Latino students across New York City while I was there at that school. But it wasn't just about their academic performance. It was about them learning their history and culture and how they created civilization before it was taken away from them. It was them learning about the continent of Africa and how Africa gave birth to Western civilization. And now that Western civilization is doing everything it can to choke the life out of our kids and our communities. And that's something we have to fight back against in everything that we do. So we did that work for about 10 years. We were innovative, we were creative, we were rooted in social action and social justice. But our kids were still suffering and our kids were still struggling. struggling. Now why were they struggling? It wasn't because of anything innately wrong with them. It was because of government policy that has been violent against the black community for hundreds of years. It's because housing insecurity is not an accident, it's by design. Food insecurity, it's not an accident, it's by design. Underfunded schools is not an accident, it's by design. Mass incarceration is not an accident, it's by design. Now, if our only answer, sidestepping for a moment, to, a, to the problem of public safety is more police, we're going to continue to fail our children. We better have real conversations about mental health. We better have real conversations about substance abuse. 
And we better have a war on poverty to finally end poverty in this country. Because as long as we have poverty, mental health disorder, substance abuse disorder, we're going to continue to have crime and continue to have an issue with public safety. So we have to get to the root causes of these issues. And that is why I ran for office in 2020. Because we had too many elected officials, not Ruben Diaz Jr., of course, and not Mayor Sean Passing Howard, of course, but we had too many elected officials that continued to sugarcoat the problem and continued to paint around the edges and not get to the core of the matter. And the thing that put me over the top in my decision to run was 34 kids died within the K-12 school system during the 2018-2019 school year. 34 kids. 17 died via suicide. A young girl, 14 years old, was being bullied at school. She had no one to talk to, no one to turn to. Right after school, she went to the top of a building in Co-op City and jumped off the building. Right down the street in New Rochelle High School, two students got into an argument, a disagreement. One student pulls out a knife, stabs the other, and kills him. This was the same year... I'm just trying to find out. I'm, I'm supposed to, it's going to work with me. I need to, somebody to tell me. Okay. Now, all we need to do is just move this. We don't need to take it. We just move it. Thank you. And yeah, you can leave it there, but we're going to pull it back after we move this. I wanted to have a conversation. Uh, with, I call him the Socrates of our time. Certainly, the scholar, the most prolific scholar, public intellectual of our generation. I think every generation produces their own in every area, in every category. And uh, if you were to tell Your parents, heroes, and who they identify with, they'd be different than yours. Because every generation produces its own. Then you get those that are phenomenal, that are multi-generational, in terms of their impact. Uh, one of the things that when I was younger, I used to travel in and out with James Brown. James Brown told me one day something that I never understood the impact until later. He said, I'm one of the few artists that grandma, mama, and the daughter know who they are. Most daughters know artists and their grandmama never heard of them. And in our generation, uh, the, uh, those of us of that generation, certainly there's been no one more prolific, more studied, more well-read, and regarded than Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. And I thought as we are engaged in now some real serious struggle, a real serious point of history, that I want to have a conversation with him so he can put into focus for us where we are both as an organization, as a tradition, and in where we are in the country and in the world. And then uh, I'm going to do that for about half hour, then I'm going to let some of you ask him questions for about half hour, then he's going to sign some some of his books that we have in the back, and uh, it is a great book. So let me get started. Dr. Dyson, first of all, thank you for being with us. Give my hand, Dr. Dyson. Dr. Dyson, uh, first of all, you've written extensively uh, about the whole Kingian tradition, Kingian movement. And you put in perspective uh, the roles many of us have played in that kind of lineage. Because I think what people don't understand is there was always different 
silos in our community. Uh, you had, at the same time, Frederick Douglass, you had Garnett, you had others that dealt differently. So what King uh, did may have been more known, but they were all way silent. Where has the King tradition gone since Dr. King? And where does man fit in? Reverend Al Sharpton, the preeminent leader, not only of black people, but people of moral awareness and conscience in this society. Speaking about a multi-generational leader, a boy preacher since he's been barely five years old, and barely older than that right now, and still on the church say amen. <laughs> Still on the front line. I mean, I'm sitting next to the LeBron James of black civil rights and leadership. Jay-Z said, never been a brother this good this long. I mean, think about it. Since you've been five, and he might be over 50 now, and he's been on no, the front line telling the truth. Never been a person this good, this long, this relevant. He ain't making rap records that you go, oh yeah, and we used to listen to. He on the charts right now. Right? And everybody coming to kiss the ring. Let's just be real. When, when they mess up, they got to fess up to Reverend Al Sharpton. And what I love about that, you see, the, the narrow-minded think of it as virtual, spiritual extortion. That ain't what it is. What it is, is bringing our tradition to bear upon the foibles, the faults, the flaws, and the aspirations of human beings, especially leaders, who are making serious impact on us as a people and they know when they ain't doing the right thing they have to be held accountable to this this is Kendrick Lamar and Kanye right because he bore witness to a street culture that had been distanced from civil rights seen as marginal and he took on the major issue that now defines the civil rights movement police brutality. He was doing it when it wasn't sexy. I know. I was there. Bourgeois Negroes were like, y'all done messed up. Y'all go to the police. Y'all go to jail. That's y'all business. Then bourgeois Negro children started getting arrested. Then bourgeois children started getting attacked. Then the police were assaulting us regardless of class. Then they started calling on the man they used to not call on at all. And then when the first black president came into office, the most unlikely to succeed became king of homecoming. And why is that? Because he comes out of a king tradition that holds power to consequence and to account without being vicious or nasty or denouncing the human being as a figure in his own right. When I think about where Nan fits in, Nan is remarkable. The trajectory of this organization over the last 30 some odd years, the trajectory of Nan being in the streets, in the suites, political power acknowledging Reverend Sharpton, political power acknowledging that without him they cannot move forward, but the people in the streets still see him as the foremost leader and voice box and amplifier of their traditions, of their interests, of their anxieties, and of their desires. Never been a brother this good, this long, to do what he does to represent us.
showing up in Riverside Church oh, yeah. do one thing and then I've seen him in the grassroots where he tunes up after taking a text and deconstructed. Ain't nobody ever done that with that kind of range and that kind of authority and that kind of authenticity. That's who we got in the Reverend Adam Sharp. Now, I want to throw to the audience, uh, give me a mic in the middle. I'm going to let about 10 or 12 of you ask your questions to Dr. Dyson about what you want. I need a mic and somebody to stand here. Where? Okay. Yeah, if you got a question, get in this aisle. I'm going to take 12. Give me 12. JT on it and cut it off at 12 or something. Now this is to ask Dr. Dyson a question. Not to get up here and preach your sermon. <laughs> Derek, what are y'all doing? Oh, okay. All right, we're in Shanti. Okay, Derek, stand there with him, because if they start preaching, take the mic. <laughs> Dr. Lyson, thank you for being here. When, when it comes to politics, um, when it comes to politics, when the midterms are coming up, they're incredibly important. Yes, sir. But the narrative is that it's a, it's a fait complete before it was even voted. How do we change that narrative? I understand historically that the, the incumbent party loses seats and all of that. Right. But that doesn't necessarily have to happen. Right. How do we change the thinking in the media and beyond so that we're prepared to do the fight that's necessary instead of feeling like there's no need to fight because we're going to lose the fight before the fight's going to be done? Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you so much for that. And you and Dan. Look, if, 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 if it were the case that we were to predict what the likely outcome would be and therefore adjust our behavior according to the likely outcome, we would never vote. Right? We would have never won nothing. But the reason we've been able to be successful as a people, as a voting bloc, uh, that is overwhelmingly uh, moving toward progressive politics or at least liberal politics, we know that black people can have cultural conservative values, a Ten Commandments religion, and a progressive politic, right? That's what throws many Republicans off because they think they can bring in some of the more acid right-wing vicious, anti-black sentiments and think because we have cultural values that are conservative that we'll somehow adjust to that. That ain't what the program is. So for me, I think that your point is well taken. Yes, we can say that in many instances, the opposite party will certainly uh, be able to snag those seats, but we can't really afford to believe in a kind of inertia. We got to get out there and vote because it means a lot more to us than a lot of other communities. You see what they did to Kentucky Jackson, Brown Jackson. You, you know, you do everything they say you're supposed to do. Harvard, check that box. Harvard, twice, check that box. Do everything, make all the judgments, be balanced. Despite them trying to go after her, and these I be uh, this ludicrous, um, you know, exaggeration of her record when she was in the mainstream. The point is that when you vote, you ain't just voting for somebody who's going to be the president or your congressperson or your senator. You're voting for the local DA. You're voting for the prosecutor. You're voting for the mayor. And when you vote, even when you vote in the higher office in federal elections. If, if President 45 ain't there, but his legacy is on the Supreme Court. The uh, officers, keepers and officers, uh, on horses, or I would say the white robot on horses, chasing those Haitians under the bridge of their real cages. And you know, and uh, this is kind of insane. What is your opinion on how whites are being embraced to see me versus the Haitians? Yes, sir. Well, you said it. You said it right there. And, and we ain't never come out in the Ukraine. Let's start at wet foot, dry foot. 
Cubans being allowed, bless them, they should be. Haitians, not so much. On one island, Dominicans versus Cubanos, right? And the Cubanos, right, and, and, the, and excuse me, the Haitians being hated on by their fellow Caribbean citizens, right? Let, let's just be real with that. And presidents who looked at the dry foot, wet foot, if you said sac passe, they passed you by. If you say, man, I'm El Senor, right, that's a different story. And we should all be together, don't get it twisted. Cubans, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, African Americans, we should all be in the same boat. But that government, if we're in the same boat, let us have the same authority to be visited upon by the federal government of resources. And some people are coming in as refugees, and some are seeking asylum. So now when you come, look, we want to support the Ukrainians. Ain't nobody mad at that. But that gun, if you got the Syrians who were dogged and dismissed and never acknowledged from the Middle East, and then when the, all the newspaper reporters, not all of them, a lot of them said, they're like us, they're European. These are white people, no disrespect. They're not black people who are refugees from some collar county of the world or country or banana republic. These are white folk. Look at the white supremacy on display. Look at the unconscious white bias on display. So while I support loving anybody who seeks asylum or who seeks refuge, start with the ones that have been there for so long who have been seeking refuge from their plight and predicament, and you had a president who said they were blank whole countries. Right.